We continue our theme by looking at a form of diversity that we find among uh, creatures, animals, um, known as the altricial precocial spectrum. This stems from the observation that many animals, when they are born, are helpless in the need of parental care, and they undergo considerable organic development outside of the womb or egg. Um, such animals are called precocial animals, sorry, altricial animals, and humans are notoriously altricial animals. In fact, we are born so helpless that we take a year before we can get up and walk anywhere, two years to use our first words, and we remain dependent on extreme parental investment for anything from, well, you're going to depend partly on their culture, isn't it? So anything from 7 to 35. Um, humans have the longest period of all the animals, the longest period in which they are dependent on parental investment. Uh, but we find the same thing in mice, rats. We find it in lots of birds. Um, and the, the other end of the spectrum is occupied by animals which... Uh, at the moment of birth or shortly after, are quickly able to perform such basic functions as locomotion, feeding and escape. Um, so in the among the precocial animals, we also find birds, we also find mammals. Um, so what we're looking at is not a function simply of the evolutionary lineage. And it's worth considering why some animals are so helpless at birth, and what the consequences are. Uh, rather than say why, we, we, what we want to ask is, what does it matter if a, an organism, an animal, has this extended period of development? There's a low-hanging mistake here, and don't make it, and that is to assume that because we are altricial, we're super, super clever, and that the precocial animals are somehow dumb. Um, the difference is not intelligence or sophistication or similarity to humans or closeness to humans. As I said, we find birds in each camp, we find mammals in each camp. And here we're looking away from genes and we're looking entirely towards the environment. Every organism that's born is born into a specific ecological niche and depending on that niche there may be the luxury as it is of um, being helpless and spending some time in which the organs of the body are still developing but they do so then in interaction with the specific environment into which one is born not all niches offer this luxury. So if you're born as an antelope on the savanna in Africa, you get up and walk after you're born or you're eaten by something else. Um, this map is quite illuminating. Um, what's shown there on the map is not the distribution of humans, but the distribution of the brown rat. Coincidentally, it's almost exactly the same as the distribution of humans. Most animals do not have this kind of vast distribution. So when we look at this, we can recognize that those skills which some animals are born with and some have to acquire um, have consequences. Um, those skills which are ready to go at birth um, don't require much fine-tuning and they're relatively invariant. So they, as it were, expect specific environmental supports. Where an animal has the luxury of a longer period of parental investment and co-development in an environment, then that organism is capable, potentially, of adapting to a wider variety of ecological niches. Now, humans manage to live in the tundra and in the jungle and in the desert and in the cities. Rats do something similar. So that altricial animals have this possibility of a modified uh, or a specific form of intertwining of the developing organism with a specific environment. Now, 
There are two ways of looking at this. We're frequently, we might hear that those animals who are born helpless, the altricial animals, bear the hallmarks of a flexible, adaptable behavior. And we might contrast it, that with inflexible, rigid instinct. And there's that word instinct, and I warned you about that. That doesn't explain very much. That doesn't illuminate what's going on. Here's another way of looking at the same contrast, which is that when we come upon an altricial animal, we should pay a great deal of attention to its environment and note the tight intertwining of its later development stages and the environment so that the adult organism is suited to a tundra or desert or whatever. But one shouldn't think of environments solely in terms of physical characteristics or even worse climactic zones. For humans, as it turns out, most of the relevant aspects of our environment are other humans, are indeed human culture and language. So that the development of human culture and language and its very, very diverse manifestations needs to be understood in this context. And here we're not separating biology and culture at all. Rather, we're recognizing that all humans are born in a helpless state and that they undergo a serious process of development after birth in which they are becoming their adult form in a specific social cultural environment. So, useful lesson there.